indeed, this worldly life's no more than a pastime and pleasure's vain. The final home, that's life for sure, with their knowledge this much attain. مالك يوم الدنيا صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد يقول الله في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إلا المودة في القربى The first of our salawat in honor of رسول الله محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم The second in honor of أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب The third with your loudest voices in honor of the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al-Asr wa'l-Zaman. Respected scholars, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. was born on the 13th of Rajab in the year 600 and died on the 21st of Ramadan in the 40th year after Hijrah. He occupies a prominent position within the religion of Islam as being revered as one of the greatest leaders in Islamic history, a man from whose life many extraordinary lessons may be learnt and many examples may be derived and a man who was seen as the embodiment of knowledge, generosity, valor and bravery, as well as dedication towards the religion of Islam. As we stated, the Imam was born on Friday the 13th of Rajab. His parents, Abu Talib and Fatima bint Asad, were both followers of the Abrahamic monotheistic way. There was a group of believers who were living in Mecca, in the early days who were followers of the message of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. What they would be classified with the word Hanifs. They would be following the way of Ibrahim and all the messengers who came after Ibrahim. This could be seen in the fact that when Abu Talib read the marriage ceremony of the Prophet to Khadija, he mentioned very clearly within the wording that I am the follower of one God and the follower of the prophets of God, especially the prophets who descended from the line of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Therefore you had Abu Talib and Ali's mother Fatima bint Asad were both Abrahamic in terms of their belief. And you found that this would be seen in the words of Fatima bint Asad on that particular period when she used to circumambulate the Kaaba. Because you had two types of people who may have circumambulated the Kaaba at that time. You had those who believed in one God but started making images for that God known as idols. Or you had a group who believed in one God and would not put any images to that God. 
Fatima bint Asad, upon her sangramulation of the Kaaba, recited a supplication that is with us until today. She said, O oh Allah, in the name of your majesty, and the name of your power, and in the name of the prophets you sent from the line of Ibrahim alayhi salam, help me in this period with the pangs of labor and the pangs of childbirth, and make it easy for me. The narrations are clear both in the books of the Imamis and in other schools in Islam. For example, if you went to study the work of Imam Al Hakim Al Nisapuri, Al Hakim Al Nisapuri has the book Al Mustadrak Ala Sahihain. Or if you went to the work of Imam Al Mas'udi in the book Muruj Al Dahab, you will find all of them narrate that when she said these words near the Kaaba, the Kaaba opened up for her and she entered the Kaaba. And she stayed within the Kaaba for three days. An honor in Islamic history only reserved for Ali ibn Abi Talib. That he is the only man in Islamic history to be born in the Kaaba. You will find that there are some other historical references to other people being born in the Kaaba. But this was a group of people who tried to diminish from the prestige of Ali ibn Abi Talib. The only man in history to be born in the Kaaba, to be born in that black cube that you find in Mecca, was Ali. And that's why you find when his mother emerged from the Kaaba on the fourth day, the first person to welcome her was the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet welcomed her, he took Ali from her hands, and the Imam himself would narrate that from that day, throughout his childhood, the Prophet would embrace Ali. He chewed the food before he'd place the food in the mouth of Ali. And even he would say, I would follow the Prophet in those early days, like the child of a she-camel would follow its mother. A she-camel, wherever it walks, its child would follow it. A child would never leave it. Ali says that in those early days, I would follow the Prophet like a child of a she-camel would follow its mother. I used to see the light of revelation and I would hear the words of prophethood. When the religion was only three, it was me, Khadija, who were always alongside the prophet. In other words, from an early age, you saw that Abu Talib gave away his sons and his children towards the religion of Islam. Because Imam Ali had three elder brothers. His eldest brother was Talib, hence Abu Talib. Talib died at the age of 55. Then the second eldest brother was Aqil. Aqil died at the age of 93. Then the third eldest brother was Ja'far, who died at the age of 40. And then it was the Imam. And you had two sisters. One was called Fakhita, and the other was called Jumana. In other words, Abu Talib and Fatima bin Asad, how many children did they have in their life? They had six children. You found that Abu Talib, because of the extreme amount of difficulty that many of the Arabs were facing at that time, the Prophet came up to him. The Prophet was how old was when Imam Ali was born? The Prophet was 30. There was a 30 year age gap between the Prophet and the Imam. The Prophet came to the Abu Talib and he said to him, Abu Talib, let me and my uncle Hamza and my uncle Abbas take responsibility for your children. Abu Talib said to him, who do you want to take responsibility of? He said, let me bring up Ali. In other words, from a young age, Rasulullah, the Prophet, wanted to bring up Ali in the way Abu Talib brought him up. He wanted to take the responsibility of bringing up the young Imam. And that's why it was only 10 years later, at the age of 10, when Imam Ali was 10, that the Prophet announced his prophethood. In those early days, there was only a few reverts, as in there was only a few people like Ammar ibn Yasser, like Bilal, and like another companion who came towards Islam in those early days because of Ali and through the Prophet. In which way, Abu Dar al-Ghafari used to belong to Bani Ghafar. Abu Dar al-Ghafari, his tribe used to worship idols. But Abu Dhar rationally, whenever he would reflect, and we said that half of religion is reflection. 
Abu Dhar, when he would reflect, he'd ask himself, how can I worship an idol which can neither benefit me nor harm me? As in many of us would say, those were the days of ignorance. I tell you, 1,400 years later, you may have a professor with three PhDs and he still bows down before something made out of a rock. Don't be surprised. You find that in those days, Abu Dhar, what did he used to say? Abu Dhar would say that I do not believe in this idea that we worship an idol. Surely an idol that cannot protect itself, how can I worship it? So he decided that he was certain of this when one day he went towards the idol that his tribe, Bani Ghaffar. And Bani Ghaffar, what were they known for? Bani Ghaffar were highway thieves. Nobody would mess about with them. In our language today, they are known as gangsters. Bani Ghaffar, Abu Dhar came to Mecca one day to worship the idol, although he never bowed down before it. One day he saw one of Bani Ghaffar bring some milk to the idol. When he saw the milk being bought to the idol, as he was about to leave, he said, wait, wait, let me actually think like a human should think. He looked at the idol and he saw the milk. Then he saw this fox come towards the milk. When he saw the fox come towards the milk, the fox came, had a nice sip of the milk and then left. And what does a fox normally do after it's had a good drink? It lets it all back out. Abu Dhar al-Ghafari said, if my idol that I worship cannot protect itself from the urine of a fox, then how is it going to protect Abu Dhar al-Ghafari? What did Abu Dhar al-Ghafari do? He said, I'm going to go and look for this man by the name of Muhammad. But how do I find him? As in remember, when Islam began, when the Prophet began, Imam Ali was only 10. In those first three years, the message was to be sent out secretly. Abu Dhar was circumambulating around the Kaaba. He's trying to look for this man who is known as As Sadiq Al Amin. But he doesn't want to tell anyone that he was looking for him because the people had begun to hear rumors that Muhammad's bringing a new religion. He saw this young man in front of him. The young man at the time was about 12, 13 years of age. He, the young man looked at him and he said, You look confused. Who are you looking for? Abu Dhar said, I don't think you know who he is. Don't worry. The young man said, no, no, don't worry, tell me, and I might know him. He said, I'm looking for Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. He looked at him and he said, I think I know him. Let me lead you to him. He said, what's your name? He said, I am Ali, son of Abu Talib. And I think I might know the man you're looking for. So he walked with Abu Dhar, they entered upon Rasulullah. Within a few moments, Abu Dhar became a Muslim. As soon as he heard the intellect of Rasulullah, he became a Muslim. Rasulullah said to Abu Dhar, he said, Abu Dhar, I plead with you, don't go and tell the people about Islam. I know that you, Bani Ghaffari, is your passionate people. Keep it quiet. Abu Dhar said, don't worry, I'll keep it as quiet as I can. A few minutes later, Abu Dhar al Ghaffari stood on the Kaaba saying, Oh people, those of you who have not heard of Islam, let me tell you, there is only one God, and that Muhammad is the messenger of God. The people straight away went and started attacking him. Abbas, the uncle of Rasulullah, intervened. Abu Dhar reached Rasulullah. Rasulullah said, Abu Dhar, I told you, don't tell anybody. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm sorry, but you know, the passion was inside me. I won't be that loud again. Rasulullah said, very well, go ahead. A few minutes later, another announcement on the Kaaba. Oh, people, if you didn't hear me properly before, then know that I am Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. And that there is only one God, and that Muhammad is his messenger. Again, then they came to attack him. Abbas, the uncle, knew that the only way to solve this situation was to come in the middle. He told the people, he whispered in the ears of one of the people, oh people, you know who this man is? They said, yes, Abu Dhar. He said, you know which tribe? They said, who? He said, Bani Ghaffar. They said, Bani Ghaffar, the highway thieves? He said, yes. Bani Ghaffar, the gangsters? Yes. Bani Ghaffar, the ones who block your caravans? As soon as the Arab knows his money is getting lost, that's it. He has no more principles. They let Abu Dhar go. But the point was what? A young Ali brought Abu Dhar towards Rasulullah. From a young age, therefore, Ali ibn Abi Talib had the maturity to be able to carry the message of the religion. And that's why when Da'wat al-Ashira happened, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse in Surah 26, verse 214, Invite and warn your nearest relatives. Rasulullah told the young Ali, he said, Ali, come near me. You are 13 years of age. I want you to do something for me. He said, what is it? He said, I want you to prepare a meal for me. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, which meal? He said, get a sheep for me. 
and get one kilo of wheat and three kilos of yogurt. And I want you to make a feast and I want you to invite your uncles and my uncles as well. Because of course, Ali's uncles are Muhammad's uncles. Abu Lahab, Abu Talib, Abu Hamza, Abbas, these are all the uncles of the two of them. When they came that day, a momentous incident occurred, which was vital in studying the biography of Ali ibn Abi Talib. What was it? That when they came that day, the Prophet had said to them on the first occasion, Welcome to my house, I have glad tidings to give you about the message of the religion. Abu Lahab did not accept. But on the second time that they came, they listened to him. The Prophet said to them, you know that I am truthful and you know that I am trustworthy. And you know that I have not lied to any of you. I have come to bring you a message of goodness, to worship only one God and not to put partners to God. And that there is a day of judgment where you will be accountable for all your acts. And that there is no difference between male and female or between black and white. Abu Lahab looked and he said, Muhammad, what is this sorcery that you're trying to bewitch us with? The Prophet then said, whoever amongst you accepts me as his Prophet will be my Caliph and the successor after me. There's a point here that from a young age, Ali was already instructed with that message to be the successor because Ali at the age of 13 raised his hands and he said, O Prophet of God, I will listen to your message and I am the first to accept your words. Abu Lahab turned around to Abu Talib. He said to him, Abu Talib, it looks like one day your son's going to have to lead you. He tried to mock him. And that's why our brothers have an interesting narration in their books. In the books of our brothers, what does it say? It says that Abu Talib in their books, it says Abu Talib came to Ali and he said to him, Ali, are you sure you want to accept this message? Are you ready for it? Ali replied at that young age full of maturity by saying, Oh my father, Allah did not ask me when he created me, therefore I don't need to ask anyone when I am submitting back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's in the books of our brothers, that Ali at that young age had the maturity to understand the message of the Prophet. Not only had the maturity, but the Prophet mentioned from that day, whoever accepts this is my successor and the Caliph after me. In other words, those who would go to Ghadir later on to prove that Ali was the successor, as the Caliph, on the contrary, Da'wat al-Ashira, Ali was a young age, already there was the sign of Ali. And that's why at that young age, the Prophet would constantly give him duties in order to allow him to mature into the development within the religion. Notice Ali at the age of 24, when the whole of Mecca has decided to combat the message of the Prophet. The Prophet at that age, Ali was 23, 24 years of age, the Prophet comes to Ali. He says to him, Ali, they have decided that they want to kill me. But not one of them, no. A number of them are going to come together and kill me. So would you do a task for me? Ali said to him, O oh, Prophet of God, what is the task? He said to him, the task is that I want you to sleep on my bed. Are you ready to sacrifice your soul for the message of the religion of Islam? Do you know what the reply is? The reply is a reply for someone at 23, an immense reply. He looked at him and he said, Ya Rasulallah, will you be safe? He replied to him, yes I will. He said, then my soul is dedicated to your soul. And my spirit is dedicated to your spirit. And then he went back into his room into prostration and three times said, Shukran Lillah, Shukran Lillah, Shukran Lillah. All thanks is to Allah, all thanks is to Allah, all thanks. Because he said, This is a night which God has honored me, where He has allowed me to sacrifice my soul for the religion of Islam. That night when they came, they tried to attack. They saw Ali sleeping in the bed of his prophet. After that, the prophet had said to him, Ali, the next day, I want you to perform a task. He said, what is it? He said, there are a number of my enemies who have deposited their trusts with me. I find no one better in this religion 
but you to return the trust back to them. That's why I remember Hanbala, the son of Abu Sufyan, heard that Ali had remained behind and was giving everyone their trust back. Hanbala, the son of Abu Sufyan, came to Umar ibn Wa'il. Hanbala said to Umar, he said, Umar, I'll give you my mother Hind's necklace. If you walk up to Ali ibn Abi Talib and say to him that we deposited a hundred mithqal of gold with Muhammad. Umar said, but we didn't. He said, Ali is not going to know. He's only 23 years of age. All Muhammad told him is, anyone who demands something from you, give it back to him. And if you do this, I'll give you my mother hen's necklace. Omar said, very well. Omar came towards Ali that day after Ali slept in the bed of Rasulullah. He said to him, Ali, you owe us something from Muhammad. He said, what is it? He said, you owe us a hundred mithqal of gold. Ali looked at his list. So what's your name? Said Omar ibn Wa'il. And who else do I owe? Hanbal ibn Abu Sufyan. He said, so Abu Sufyan deposited something with uh, Rasulullah? He said, yes. He said, so you want a hundred mithqal of gold from me? He said, yes, you're the one Muhammad has chosen that you've got to return the deposits. He said, very well. Do you have any witnesses? He said, yes. He said, who? He said, Abu Sufyan, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, and Walid. MashaAllah, the best list of witnesses you can have. Ali left him and he said, I'll go and ask each one of them. Let them give me the time of when exactly it was that they had deposited. So he went to Abu Sufyan and said, Abu Sufyan, had you deposited a hundred mithqal of gold with Muhammad? Abu Sufyan said, no, I don't remember anything. He said, Abu Jahl, did you see a hundred mithqal of gold being deposited? He said, yes, I saw it. It was in the morning. Abu Lahab, did you see a hundred mithqal of gold? He said, yes, of course. He said, when was it? He said, in the evening. The fourth person, when was it? He, was, he said, it's clear, it was at sunrise. All four of them gave different answers. Ali said very clearly, you are lying towards me. But the point was that Ali was given that responsibility. Rasulullah had already left and he had gone towards Medina. When he had left, Ali had a responsibility number three. After sleeping in the bed, after returning the trusts, he had to take the Fatimas to Medina with him. Who did he take? He took Fatima, the lady of light, the daughter of the Prophet. He took his mother, Fatima bint Asad. He took Fatima, the daughter of Hamza, his uncle. And they went towards Medina. And I tell you something, many people do not acknowledge how unsafe the journey was for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Many people think Rasulullah and Abu Bakr had an unsafe journey. They do not realize that when they couldn't catch up with Rasulullah, they put their eyes on Ali. And it was that journey when they realized that they had a warrior on their hands who none of them will ever face in war. Because Ali ibn Abi Talib on his way to Medina, when, do you know when he reached Medina, he met Rasulullah before Medina at Masjid Qiba. Those of you who've been to Hajj will know about Masjid Qiba. All of you have to visit Masjid Qiba at that period. Masjid Qiba, Rasulullah was at Qiba, he was going to go to Medina. They said to me, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you leave for Medina? He said, how can I leave without the son of Abu Talib alongside me? I'm going to wait here until Ali reaches me. Do you know when Ali ibn Abi Talib reached, his whole body was full of blood. They had ambushed him and he himself stood up for the Fatimas. You think Fatima is Zahra would marry, uh, would marry any man? She saw Ali ibn Abi Talib defend her so valiantly even before he had married her. His body was full of blood. And it was during that journey that he made it clear. I do not mind me alone fighting all of you. Because I know I will come out victorious. And that's why as soon as he reached Medina, Rasulullah did two things for him to honor his position. The first thing Rasulullah did, he made a brotherhood between the Ansar and the Muhajireen. The Muhajireen were the migrants who left Mecca to go to Medina. The Ansar were the people of Medina. Rasulullah didn't want any tension between the two of them. So he brought the two of them together and he gave each of the Muhajireen an Ansari partner. It was known as the Pact of brotherhood for the Muhajireen. For example, Abu Bakr, he gave Kharij ibn Zuhair al-Khazraji. Omar, he gave Aitan ibn Malik. Uthman, he gave Al-Aws ibn Thabit. The people asked, Ya Rasulallah, who is your partner? Who is your brother? He said, for me only Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
He said, Ali is to me like Aaron was to Moses, except that there is no prophet after me. Then number two, there were many of the companions whose houses were in Mecca or in Medina. All their doors would open to the mosque. Allah ordered that every one of those doors is to be closed except the door of Ali and Fatima. In other words, there was a distinction given to Ali and you find the son of Abu Talib from a young age. In his first battle for the religion of Islam at the age of 24, the battle of Badr, then the battle of Uhud, then the battle of Khanda, then the battle of Khaybar, showed a distinction like none others on the battlefield. I tell you, in Islamic history, they try to give you many names for great warriors. There is not a single warrior in Islamic history who came near the dust of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib on the battlefield had a distinction. Someone will say, what's the distinction? At Badr, half of the opposition were destroyed by Ali ibn Abi Talib. At Uhud, Rasulullah was alone on the mountain. It was Ali, Miqdad, Ammar, Abu Dujan al-Ansari, and a lady called al harithiyah who helped him. And on that day on Uhud, that was when the famous cry came, there is no youth but Ali, and no sword but Dhul-Fiqar. But at Khandaq and Khaybar, he displayed a spiritual side to him which made him the complete human being. What do I mean? I mean a warrior is normally reckless, aren't they? Warriors are reckless. And not only are they reckless, they tend to be arrogant as well, isn't it? These combinations are normally the combinations of a warrior. They're either reckless or arrogant. You hardly find any ethics in warriors. It's very rare to find any spirituality in warriors. You know when he finished Khandaq and Khaybar, he did two things after those battles which showed Rumi's famous lines when Rumi said, in bravery you are the lion of your Lord, but in generosity who knows who you are? Rumi says about Ali, in bravery, you are the lion of your Lord, but in generosity, who knows who you are? At Khandaq, Amr ibn Awid kept on telling them, who's going to come out and fight me? What's wrong with you people? Muhammad promises you heaven. If I kill you, you go to heaven. If you kill me, you will go to heaven. Why don't you fight? Ali came out to fight him. When he introduced himself, he said, what's your name? He said, I am Ali, son of Abu Talib. He said to him, I will not kill you. Your dad was a good friend of mine. You can go. The Imam replied, but I will kill you because you're an enemy of Allah. When they began the war, Amr ibn Awid knew that he'd win. Amr ibn Awid was known for wrestling with the lions. Midway through the war, the people noticed the dust had gathered between the two in combat. Ali walks away, pauses, then comes back in and strikes, and emerges and says, God is great. The people are confused. When the people were confused, they asked Ali upon his return, what was that moment that you paused? There is a moment in Ali ibn Abi Talib, which is a lesson for all of us. If man angers you, remain patient. Only get angry when, you, when Allah's message is angered. Because when Ali came back, they said to him, why did you walk away? He said, as I was about to strike Amr ibn Awid, he spat at me. If I struck him, then I would have struck him for my own ego. But I never strike a human because of my ego. So I walked away. I returned back into the battle and I struck him because he angered the message of God. Further than this, in the opposition army, Amr ibn Awid's sister was sitting. She was having a meal. She thought her brother would come back victorious. Someone came back to her and said to her that we have some sad news for you. She said, what is it? She replied by saying, they replied to her by saying, your brother has been killed. She said, my brother has been killed? My brother who kills the lions? Which lion killed my brother? They said to a young man known as Ali ibn Abi Talib, she said, do you mind if I go and see my brother's body and I will then tell you what I think of Ali ibn Abi Talib. She went towards the brother's body. She was crying and crying and crying. She came near her brother's body. The narrations, what do they state? The narration states, she sat by the brother's body. 
She then suddenly got up and she smiled. And she called out to everyone, I am honored the son of Abu Talib killed my brother. Why? She said, my brother, before he begins a war, asks the person he's fighting, I beg of you, if you're a sincere human, if you do kill me, don't take my shield because it belongs to my great-grandfathers. Let it at least stay with my family. She said, I look at my brother's body and I see his shield is still on his body. And it makes me understand that the son of Abu Talib fights for no one but his Lord. Because if the son of Abu Talib was fighting for his ego, then he would have been like the rest of Muhammad's army who would have stolen my brother's shield. But the son of Abu Talib is different to the rest of them. Then at Khaybar, Khaybar he lifts a gate which none can lift. I'm not concerned with the, what he lifted. What I'm concerned is what allows you to be so powerful. Because you know after Khaybar, he, he comes back from the battle, he begins to cry. They come to him, they say, Oh, son of Abu Talib, why do you cry? You've just lifted a gate, others can't lift. He replies by saying, I can't bear to see the Jewish soldiers with a rope around their hands. Loosen the rope. Are they not human beings? Then he returns home. His wife Fatima is next to him. She offers him some bread. He was known for his piety that he would only eat dry bread, not soft bread. Because he would say, how can I eat soft bread when there are poor in the Muslim world? He tries to break the bread, but the bread doesn't break. They say, oh son of Abu Talib, you lifted a gate which 40 couldn't lift and you can't break a piece of bread. He said, the gate I lifted for Allah, the bread I'm trying to break is for Ali. And then he said, I lifted the gate of Khaybar, not with my physical strength, but with the strength of my ruh. If I could understand my soul, then I can understand my Lord. And the moment I understand my Lord, everything is easy before me. And even after that battle at Hunayn, were it not for Ali staying behind, this religion would have been destroyed. The greatest performance of Ali ibn Abi Talib, and I ask all of you to read upon it, was at Hunayn, not at Badr, not at Ahud, not at Khaybar, not at Khandaq. Imam Zain al Abdin in Sham says, I am the son of the one who fought at Badr and Hunayn, because Ali at Hunayn was left alone against the opposition and finished them. And that's why you find that Ali ibn Abi Talib, when Rasulullah died, just before the Prophet died, the Prophet was 63, Ali was 33, the Prophet had told the people, this is my successor, look after him, be loyal to him, don't deceive him, don't be cunning towards him, don't attack him. He's not just my son-in-law, he's appointed by Allah to look after my message. The people ended up taking away the leadership of Ali ibn Abi Talib. They took his leadership, they attacked his wife and they killed her, and he was left to look after four orphans in a house. Yet did Ali ibn Abi Talib allow his ego to get to him? Because sometimes with ourselves in Muslim communities, if someone takes our leadership, we want to destroy the whole community. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, the religion of Islam is greater than me causing disunity. I will remain someone. When I see injustice, I'll speak out against it. Any form of injustice that exists, because some people say, Ali ibn Abi Talib when Rasulullah died was 33, and he became caliph, the fourth caliph, at the age of 58. Some people say in those 25 years, Ali ibn Abi Talib, did he do anything for Islam? Or did he just go and earn a living and give food to the children of Fatima? On the contrary, Ali ibn Abi Talib in those years, even though he wasn't the Khalifa chosen at Saqifa, he was still the Khalifa for Ammar and Salman and Abu Dhar and Muhammad and so on. Ali ibn Abi Talib, therefore, if he saw any injustice, he would speak out. He wouldn't just remain silent. He taught us an ethical lesson. Muslims, when you see zulm of any type, be it big, be it small, never remain silent against injustice. That's why, for example, one day, a lady came to Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second Khalifa. She came to him, she said, I have committed adultery. Umar said, were there witnesses? She said, yes, there were witnesses and I'm willing to be punished. 
Omar said, very well, then punish her. The reply was, but do you mind if Ali ibn Abi Talib makes the decision? He said, so why? She said, because I have a trust that Ali ibn Abi Talib is the most just human living on this earth. I know that he was brought up in the lap of Rasulullah. So who else can teach justice but Muhammad? So he said, Ali, come and judge her. When Ali came, he said, what is it? She said, I committed adultery. Ali said, what was the circumstances? She said, I have no food for my children. And I went to ask one of the rich men of the area. He said to me, if you want food, you have to commit adultery with me. She said to him, oh man, I beg you, fear God, do not say such words. Second time, third time, she said, I gave in. Imam Ali said, very well, you are free to leave. She said to him, what do you mean? He said, chapter 5, verse number 3. She said, what do you mean? Omar then looked at him and said, what do you mean? He said in chapter 5, verse number 3, says, those who are compelled to sin, while they are in a state of hunger, Allah forgives their sin. This lady was compelled to sin, but she was in a state of hunger. Allah forgives those who are in a state of hunger, because it's the shame on the state, not the shame on the people. The state shouldn't allow a lady to be in such a situation. That's when Omar would say, were it not for Ali, Omar would be perished. Because here, Ali would come out very clearly. If there is injustice, even Uthman, the third Khalifa, when he appointed his family from Bani Umayyah, Ali did not remain silent. He would speak out. And even Ali, in those 25 years when he was not Khalifa, he would come forward and say to the people, Oh people, if you have any areas of knowledge, ask me before you lose me. I know the secrets of the heavens as well as the secrets of the earth. That's why the non-Muslims would come to Medina. They'd ask, where is Ali ibn Abi Talib? The people would say, why? They say, because we hear that he is the successor to the Prophet. We want to ask him questions which none can answer. And if he can answer them, then we follow him. So they come to Ali ibn Abi Talib. One Jewish man came to Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said to him, you claim to be the successor of Muhammad? He said, yes. He said, I'm going to ask you a mathematical question which no human can answer. And it's written in the religious books. And only the successor of Muhammad can answer. So he looked at him and he said to him, go ahead. He said, which number, if you divide it by any number between 1 and 10, remains a whole number? Ali ibn Abi Talib looked at him and he said, 2,520. He said to him, sorry? He said, 2,520. He said, how did you get that? He said, the number of days in the week multiplied by the number of days in the year. The person looked at him and he said, okay, in the Arabian calendar, there's 360 days in the year. And there's seven days in the week. He said, so multiply 360 by seven, what'd you get? He said, 2520. He said, divide 2520 by one, what'd you get? He said, 2520. By two, 1260. By three, 840. By four, 630. By five, 504. By six, what'd you get? 420. By seven, 360. By eight, 315. By nine, 280. By 10, 252. He said, truly, this is Ali ibn Abi Talib in front of me. 2520 divided by any number between 1 and 10 is the only number in the world that comes out whole. And you found that people would come and ask for knowledge until he became Khalifa. And you know what the tragedy in this religion is? We didn't use Ali ibn Abi Talib like we could have. Four years, Khalifa, three civil wars fought against him. And I tell you, in each of those civil wars, each one of them, the dignity that he displayed is a message for each Muslim in the world today. That even when another Muslim acts rudely towards you, if you're a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib, act tolerant back towards them. I know there are Muslims in the world today who may look at the Imamis and be disrespectful towards us, who may call us the people of innovation, who may call us the people of shirk. Don't reply back by falling to their level. Maintain your dignity like your Imam maintained his dignity. At Jamal, he sees the lady is leading him as the wife of Rasulullah. Others around him are saying, show disrespect. He says, never. When he came towards Malik al Ashtar, he says, Malik, do you see her? She's sitting on the camel. Malik said, yes. He said, I want you to go and cut the feet of the camel. Then he told another companion, when she falls, I want you to hold her body. 
Malik went, he cut the feet of the camel. As soon as she fell, the other companion held her body. She turned around and she said, How dare you touch the body of the wife of Rasulullah when you are not mahram to me? To which the reply was, I am Muhammad, the son of Abu Bakr, your brother holding you. The only man in Ali's army who's mahram to her. Ali could have lowered his dignity and hers by sending anyone. But no, the son of Abu Talib is above this. The son of Abu Talib is on a level above all of this low dignity. And then he sent her back with respect. He said, this is the wife of Rasulullah. She used to be respected on her way back towards Medina. There should be no one who shows disrespect towards her. And she turned around to him and she said, you're the killer of the loved ones. He replied back to her, if I'm the killer of the loved ones, then people like Marwan and Abdullah and Subhan, I could have killed them right now. But I don't want disunity in the Muslim Ummah. The school of Ahl al-Bayt should never open the door for disunity. Then look at Safin. First they fight him as Khalifa and Jamal. Then at Safin when they fight him, Muawiyah takes control of the water. Imam looks at his soldiers. He says, ask Muawiyah, let us drink water. We're thirsty. Muawiyah says, I'll never give them any water. Imam tells the soldiers, go and win the water back. They win the water back. It's now in the possessions of Ali. The reply now at this moment is what? The soldiers of Muawiyah are thirsty. They come to the soldiers of Ali and they say, please give us water. Imam looks at his soldiers. He says, do you think we should give them water or no? The soldiers say, no, don't give them. They don't deserve. They didn't give us. Imam said, no. He said, I can't bear to see a horse thirsty, let alone a human being. In Nahrawan, when his own soldiers from his army come to fight him, the Khawarij come and fight him. He's in one-on-one -on -one combat with one of them. Dhul Fiqar, his sword, the double-pointed sword, has an ability to capture your sword. So he captures his sword, now he's got two swords. That soldier looks at him and he says, what are you going to do? You're going to finish me? Ali says, what is it that you want? The soldier says, I hear Ali ibn Abi Talib never rejects when a person asks him for something. So he says, ask me. He said, I want the swords. Ali said, take them. The person looked at him and he said, I want to join your path. He said, no, say, I want to join the path of Allah's justice. Don't look at me. Every drop of my existence is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the akhlaq of Ali ibn Abi Talib is what makes a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because after Nahrawan he's walking, he sees a lady. He comes near her and sees her boiling some water and stirring it. He says to her, oh lady, what's wrong? I see you stirring some water. She says, may God curse the son of Abu Talib. He says, so why do you say this? She says that Nahrawan, he took my brothers, my sons and my husband. He comes back alive and they come back dead. May God curse him. If I were to meet him one day, I'll tell him how much I hate him. He said to her lady, and how are you now? She said, look at me, I have orphan children, no one to help. You know what he did? Every morning he'd go and carry the wheat and he'd come and bake the bread. Would you reply like that to someone who curses you honestly? And we call ourselves followers of Ali? He would come until one day her daughter had returned. When her daughter had returned, Ali ibn Abi Talib, the daughter had come in. She saw Ali leaving. Salaamu alaikum, alaikum assalam. She was mesmerized. She turned around and she looked at her mother. She said, Mom, did you see who walked in? Did you see who was here? The mother says, I don't know. A very generous and humble man, but I don't know his name. She said, that was Ali ibn Abi Talib. She looked at her, she said, that's Ali? She said, yes. She said, I've been cursing him every morning in his face. She ran back to him. She said, oh, son of Abu Talib, forgive me. I did not know your true character. He said to her, oh, lady, forgive me if I ever hurt you in the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Akhlaq of Amir al muminin Today, when we have an issue with someone, they curse us, we keep that hatred with us forever. Whereas Ali would teach us, no, don't keep that. And that's why while Khalifa, nobody but nobody loved and respected Ali ibn Abi Talib like non-Muslims. His Muslims were killing him, were fighting him. Ali ibn Abi Talib, the Christians and the Jews loved him and mourned him. Imagine. 
that when Ali has a famous line in his letter to Malik al Ashtar, which Kofi Annan in the United Nations said is the greatest letter of government ever written by a human being. Imam Ali's letter to Malik al Ashtar in Nahd al Balagha. Imam Ali tells Malik, Malik, know that people are of two types. They are either your brothers in faith or your equals in humanity. And in another line, he says, and this line should be cemented on the walls of our mosques. No, O oh Muslims, our enemy is not the Christians or the Jews. Our enemy is our own ignorance. When he walks past the church, his companion says to him, I wonder how much polytheism is being done by the people of the church. Imam says, I wonder how much monotheism is being worshipped. One looked at the cup half empty. Ali would look at the cup half full. When he'd walk in the street, if there was a Christian begging, Ali would say, why is this man begging? When he was young, we'd look after him because he was working for us. Now he's old, no one looks after him. I will not move from my position until one of you promises to sponsor this Christian. And that Jewish man who cried for Ali when he heard he died, they asked him why. He said, I was walking towards Kufa with a stranger. And I was walking towards my home with this man going towards Kufa. This man was a stranger. We started talking. I told him I'm Jewish. He said he is Muslim. We kept on talking and talking. Today Muslims, as soon as they see someone Jewish, they generalize that all the Jewish people are wrong. All the Jewish people are bad. Whereas I tell you, sometimes you may find a Jewish person has got more humility than some of our own people. He says, I was talking with him. I said, I'm Jewish. He's Muslim. We're talking and talking and talking. And I remembered in the beginning of the conversation, he said, I'm going to Kufa. But now we had gone past Kufa, going towards my house. So I turned around to him, I said, oh man, you said you're going to Kufa. Why are you still walking with me? He said, because in Islam, we have been taught that the right of the person who travels with us is that we do not leave them until they give us permission. You never gave me permission. So I kept on walking to your house. He said, go ahead, I give you permission. Today I have learned about your religion through your morals. The narration states that that Jewish man, as Ali left, his Jewish friend came up to him, he said, how did you form a relationship with him? He said, what do you mean? He said, do you know who that was? He said, no, just one of the Muslims who lives as part of the empire. He said, that's the head of the empire. He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib? He said, yes. He said, the caliph of the whole Islamic state? He said, yes. He said, why did he come near the Jewish areas? He said, would you believe he said to me, the rights in Islam of a traveler is that you have to wait for their permission before you, they let you go. That morals of Ali ibn Abi Talib would continue until the day he died. And that's why after Ibn Muljam struck him, after Ibn Muljam struck him, tell me which human being says, give water to my killer, he is thirsty. Which human says, feed my killer what you're going to feed me? Which human says, give shelter to my killer in the way you've given shelter to me? Ali ibn Abi Talib, the human being, is an example for each and every one of us in our life. And that's why his legacy can be seen where? Malik died for Ali. Hujr bin Adi died for Ali. Muhammad bin Abi Bakr died for Ali. Qambar died for Ali. Kumail died for Ali. Maytham al Tamar died for Ali. Amr bin Hamak al Khuzai died for Ali. Rush. There's not a single human except Rasulullah, who so many humans have given their lives because of the human being that he was. Ranjeev Gandhi would say, I would never enter a cabinet meeting in my government without a new minister being given Ali's letter to Malik al Ashtar. Ranjeev Gandhi. Kofi Annan would say, That letter to Malik al Ashtar is the greatest letter anyone has ever written. Ralph Emerson, the famous American philosopher, would say, No human can understand the essence of humanity like Ali ibn Abi Talib. How? He says, Look at the mixture on one human being. In one minute, he's a warrior. The next minute, he's a leader. The next minute, he's a man of knowledge. The next minute, he's a man of philosophy. Have you seen a human being as rounded? He says, Look at his words. Which human says, Oh mankind, you came from a drop of semen and you leave as a piece of dust. You don't don't know when you came and you don't know when you're going so why do you walk around like you know everything 
He says, which human would say, mankind, know yourself, then you'll know your Lord. He says, which human would look at the peacock and say, the peacock is the clearest sign of an arrogant creation which is insecure. Because a peacock makes you look at its feathers because it's insecure about its skinny legs. Which human being has understood the essence of worship that he says, God, I do not worship you because of my fear of hell, because that's the worship of a slave. And I don't worship you because of my love of heaven, because that's the worship of a businessman. I worship you because you are worthy of worship. That's the worship of a free man. Look at du'as like Kumail, like Mashlul, from the tongue of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that's why a fitting line is the line of the Sikh poet, Kinnor Singh, who says, Oh Ali, you belong to every faith, every age and all people. We'll never let anyone take your honor and we'll never let anyone claim you as your own because Ali ibn Abi Talib belongs to every human being. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Ali ibn Abi Talib and to allow us to be amongst his companions and those who follow his message. Allow us to receive his intercession in this world and the hereafter. Inshallah tomorrow we will continue the biography of Imam al Hussein. For as you know, Imam al Hassan will be on the last night of the Majalis and his Wilada. Tomorrow will be the biography of Imam al Hussein. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.